First of all, you got your bike, you got your slain and you got your law and you headed to the bog. And usually it, it was always in the month of May or early May. May was a great month for the bog because the day was long and you could get a lot of drying. You know, and the, for, for we say May and June and then in July we'd be bringing home the turf. So as it's demonstrated here today where the bog was scrawled, then it was cleaned off, then you had to nick it and then we had three or four gentlemen with their slawns or slains and we had the people with their wheelbarrow taking it out and their, their forks and spreading it. It's great to think that there's still an interest in doing work on the bog. You have to scrod, and which is probably the, the severest work, you know. You, you, more, you measure it out. This. You'd have some people who cut it four sods wide or five sods wide. Usually four or five sods wide was the general picture. And then it depended on the bank of turf that you was cutting. Some banks of turf, uh, there was six spit. We used to call it a spit of turf. There was four spit, five spit, and six spit. Six spit was probably the most that ever w was uh, taken out. Also, here in, in this area where you see uh, the bog that we're after showing and doing the demonstration on, it should be about 120 yards in, in length. They called them an acre, side of an acre. And I know when I was cutting turf in my young days and my brother, we used to cut 40 yards of that per hour. So, like, you, you didn't need any gym in the evening after that. I used to work the donkey, yes, definitely, yes. We used to call them velvet lugs. <laughs> <laughs> and you know he he, he was he was a ma a marvelous animal. There was no question about it. Like it was great fun in the morning catching the donkey and putting the uh, straddle on him and the cleaves and the belly band. So it all consisted of the belly band and the chirach that was going round his tail to stop the load of turf from going right out over his ears. Of course, there was a great a great um, thing of making mats. You know, you made mats out of the straw for to put on the donkey's back as well. Oh, the straw mats, yeah. I, I used to make the straw mats. I still make some hens' nests and uh, uh, straw boys hats, and they're simple. And uh, the mats for the donkey, which there's no use much for them now. Uh, I'm Billy Gallagher. I'm from Clare Island originally, and I'm living out here now. It was much the same, except there's, it was a wooden crutch that was on the straddle and two scurrows instead of four. The belly bands were put underneath and the crupper then would be going across under its tail. Um, the cleaves were a bit different too. There was a mouth put on them, what we'd call a mouth toe. And there'd be a tornog underneath and a souple. And you'd pull the rope off the, off the souple and it'd let the, let the turf instead of taking it out. Sad by sad, and uh, all the turf <coughs> that was brought into that island it was up in the mountains, so it was, you could only bring it on a donkey and cleaves. You couldn't bring a cart or a tractor up to it. So that was the way it was done. And that's that's about all I have to say. Well, more, more or less, you know, there were two people and, honest to goodness, there was often one on his own, you know, it depended on the help that was in the house. And then it was, as it was cut, we used to, we never cut down turf in our area at all. It was, you know, put straight out on spit after spit and then you come along maybe in, it depended on the weather, you come along in about 10 or 12 days and spread all the, the sods, you know. And the, there was one knack in it as well was where you had the turf along the bank you could make two rows of it and you know you always got the, the turf on the edge of the bank to dry quicker than the turf that was out. Well the hollow bog is where you took the, the turf away from we can see you there you know the hollow bog and honestly 
you, uh, about the last spit usually would be put out in the hollow bog, you know, because if you had five, we'd say, going up on the bank, it'd be a, an awful amount of and the last spit goes out in the hollow bog. It depended as well. You might get a hollow bog that you could put a canoe in, but then you couldn't put turf out in it. You see, you spread it first and leave it then for, we'd say, maybe two weeks, or it depended on the weather. Sometimes you'd get great weather, sometimes you wouldn't get good weather. But then it was footed, like five or six, five, we used to call it footing. And it, you'd put five or six sods together and you had your one across on top. Uh, often if it was drier, you'd put maybe a good lot of it together. And we used to call them making good grogins of it. I've I seen it in my time in bad weather where you'd have to, uh, what they used to call, ray foot it. And that was where you went along and uh, you'd have to take out the wet sods out of the foots itself and put them together and make another foot out of it. So that was called ray footing. It depended on like places you was. It, there was uh, you put it out on the side of the road if you was near enough. But some people maybe would take it straight home. But usually there'd be a stack made on the side of the road and to be left there for whenever the, the farmer or the people would be, you know, free again to do the the bringing home of the turf. And it was a custom, uh, you know, as well, that you'd like to have the reek of turf at home by reek Sunday, the tw last Sunday in July. Yeah. But it, dep it, it was all dependent on the weather, you know. How the footing of the turf was a sight to see How people worked together in perfect harmony One would help the other and the favour they return to make sure when winter came we all had turf to burn. Put four sods standing up, I heard my father say, put two more across them so together they would stay. Put three more on top of them to make them nice and high, or the wind and sun could get to them and quickly they would dry. What we did here today is a tribute to the memory of the great men and women in the past who came here and cut their turf and with the simplest tools, which are like the spade and the slawn and the fork, the scythe, they cultivated the earth and they sowed whatever they needed to sustain themselves. And they cut their turf and they saved it with great nature and affection. They brought it home and it used it to cook and to heat the homes. And that's all the heat that ever was in any of the homes was the turf fire. And they did all that with the greatest care for the environment and with the great care for nature and they looked after their farms, they looked after the environment, they looked after the climate and they did it all in a happy comfortable way. Of course the bottle of tea was was the thing. And then we brought, you know, you'd make a fire and you could put it down, you could make tea in, in a teapot as well, it, it depended. You could boil the eggs there and, you know, you could roast the eggs as well and they'd crack and there was a bit of fun out of that as well and, and peel off the shells off them and stuff like that. And then we'd say, uh, maybe at five o'clock in the evening, anybody that was near enough a bog, well, maybe the child coming from school would bring four or five bottles of tea, you know, you'd have what you call evening tea at five o'clock in the evening. Well, why it is in the sock is it kept the, the, the contents warm as well, definitely, yeah. Yeah, it was, that time it was a good knitted sock, you know. Yeah, another nice drink there, it, that was mostly, it was called skedging, and that was uh, the contents of milk and water put in a sweet can more or less. The sweet can was made by the travelling people that time. The, the, the tinsmith, you know, they'd, you'd have them, you'd have, there was a, a, a small can and there was, there was a bigger can, it was called a hoop can. 
the, the big can had a hoop on it, but the little sweet can. Uh, then you, you, at that time as well, you see, there was in the shops, there was bullseyes and a lot of them sort of sweets in them sweet cans. But the tinsmith made the cans that time as well. But the schedule was a great drink for the tough. We had lots of midges in the bog, there's no question about that, and they were one of the seven deadly sins, I think, <laughs> definitely. They were midges, yeah? And, but then again, you had to work through it. Now, the other thing that was in the bog as well, if you want to say it, was where you had children, you know, with the, uh, we were in your bare feet that would be in the bog. And there was another thing there that, Oirach, Oirach was, some, was something else. And what the cure for that was, the moss that's in the, you know, grown in the bog, and you'd go in there and you'd dip your feet and you'd rub the moss on the air and it would cool it down. So there, w there was some, there, was, there is some cure in the moss, definitely. The the air is where you, where um, you, you know, the, your your feet, your your from your toes to your instep. It w with the dry weather, you see, it your the flesh would crack. And you could get like hacks on your fingers as well. But the Irish on the feet for children now was. And we had no soda cream that time. <laughs> now, and cheers. <laughs> Where Delphi lies in calm repose, as peaceful as the dawn. Where the morning sun sheds golden rays. On that range to Thalabon, where Dula sleeps between the hills, with Milray over all, not seen more grand in any lands than Ashley's waterfall. Oh, I long to be there to breathe the air. From the fields of new mown hay, and lift to the lake a dawn or dark over Kellery Bay. The echoing fells adown the dells are the thrill of the call you call o'er oh, those hills and braes, those rills and lays. Around Ashley's waterfall. Oh, I long to glance o'er boyish haunts, those scenes that I love best. And I'll lean on me on a summer's day, and the sun going down to rest. Are the moonlight on the earth hills when the balmy twilight falls o'er those hills and braes, those rills and lays around Ashley's waterfall? Oh, I long to rest nigh the surging crest. Of my own beloved Mayo, and finally view those mountains blue in the dearest place I know. God's good right hand had never planned a beautiful day like this in the bogs of Shanaclia. And we are all here to celebrate. Ginny. Yeah, yeah. Oh, 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 oh.